Continuing on with the player season recap series today, we're going to cap off the reserve guards by talking about three of them who played in less than 30 games for the Pacers this season. TJ McConnell, Ricky Rubio, and Brad Wanamaker will talk about their seasons, what the Pacers can learn from them, and their potential free agencies all on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News, and today we're reviewing the season of more Pacers players, knocking out some reserve guards today, three of which who played less than 30 games for the Pacers. We did the over 30 game backup guards pod a few weeks ago today. We'll look at TJ McConnell. Ricky Rubio and Brad want to make your season for the Pacers. What can be learned about the Pacers and those players from their season, what their future holds with the team, if they'll even be on the team next year. A lot of trade talk today. And what can be learned from those players that the Pacers need to take away and say, hey, we maybe screwed up with this guy. I think it's obvious what I'm talking about there. Or, you know, how can we maximize this guy instead? Always lots to learn about every player, even if they have a small impact on the season. Thank you for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And let's dive in with TJ McConnell, who had a very bizarro season at 27 games. Played the first 24 of them uh, really early in the season. Played all the Pacers games uh, from the start of the season through December 1st. And then didn't play till April uh, 5th, April 5th, I almost just said 25th, uh, which, you know, the wrist injury makes his season really hard to kind of break down because it was so segmented. His stats got all wonky playing at the end. His minutes with Halliburton were interesting, and you learned a little bit about him, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But it was really a strange season for T.J. McConnell because I don't think he played you, – you watch T.J. McConnell in Rick Carlisle's system a little more spread out, more encouraging of threes, still loves the drive and kick in the way Bjorkren did, right – Besides the shooting part, a lot of stuff that T.J. McConnell should be awesome at, should fit in pretty well. And yet, across the board, his numbers were down, right? Even if you go to per 36, he played less minutes than last year, so the per game stats aren't totally fair. Per 36, his scoring was up, which obviously means something, but his shooting percentage was down, his three-point percentage was down from last year, his rebounding was down from last year per minute, his assists were down per minute, his steals were down per minute. You know, a lot of stuff suggests that his production was a little worse just because he kind of shifted into new roles where he was playing alongside other guards who handled the ball more, and he was playing as a guy who was stuck in the corner more. And I think that is where, when I look back at this first TJ McConnell season under Rick Carlisle, I think he played well. His stats just kind of are muddied, and, and looking back on the season is weird because he actually played as kind of an off-ball guard more often than he ever has in his career. And I don't think that was a good decision by the Pacers, despite being something they kind of had to do at times, given the injuries that they had and the other options that they had at that guard spot. But you know, that kind of muddies the season TJ McConnell had looking back. And something the Pacers need to learn from is like, how do they not set themselves up in these situations anymore where a guy like McConnell needs to be playing as an off-ball guard? So as the structure of these goes, what was good and bad about the player's season? One stat that tells it all, an area for growth in the player's future with the team. For McConnell, what was good about his season? Do you all will remember, this seems like a lifetime ago. Early November run from TJ McConnell, where the Pacers were one and six, and then they won five out of seven, saved their season. They're two games under 500 all of a sudden at six and eight, looking like a capable team, like the one that everybody thought would be good before the season started. And who saved their season and turned it around? How about TJ McConnell from November 1st to November 13th? This is the best part of McConnell's season by a mile. 14 points per game, six assists per game. Diamond dudes up, high steal numbers, shot 56% from three, 62% from the field, and was fantastic for the Pacers in that stretch. 19 points against Portland, 18 points in a close win against Sacramento, 16 points against Denver, 21 in a huge win over the Utah Jazz, 10 assists in a, in, a, in a game against the Spurs, and then closing it off with 8-9 and nine in a win over his former team, the Philadelphia 76ers. That stretch was massive for McConnell. He absolutely killed it in that time frame. And it was it, it kind of showed to me, you know, despite him having moments where, again, he was playing as an off-ball guard and had like a kind of roller coaster season with his wrist injury, when fully maximized in the Carlisle system. Because at that time, Levert was back. You know, guys were... That was the healthiest the Pacers were, really, was this stretch, approximately this stretch, maybe a little later in the month of November. 
But that was about the healthiest stretch the Pacers had all season. And when guys were in their role, the Pacers were playing okay, including McConnell, who was able to, you know, the, the assist numbers are what stand out because when you look at his full season, his assist number is not as high. But in that stretch over six a game, you know, kind of shows where he was at because for the season, that number was below five at 4.9, right? So in that stretch, he kind of, he kind of, showed what he can be at his absolute best. And I think that was the good part about his season is in the ideal role, he still played well despite some up and down numbers. Now, that's the bad part about his season is the numbers. And it's not just the per per minute number stuff, but it is concerning to me that the numbers were basically down across the board, at least from a fit perspective with a new coach and a new style. Like you go to TJ McConnell's advanced stats. He led the league in steal percentage in under Nate Bjorker in 2020, 3.4%, down to 2.2% this last season, the second lowest of his entire Career. Turnover rate was a little bit better. Bettest of his ever career, but his usage was up, and you'd expect a guy with usage up to have better numbers. And yet his numbers were not generally better when he was out there. His true shooting percentage of 52.5, his lowest since 2017, as his shot just kind of deteriorated. He couldn't get to the line as much. Like, I don't, again, watching him, like, it doesn't look like he was playing that much worse this season. But his, you know, the net rating stats with the Pacers, plus 2.6. His first year, plus 2.1, minus 4.8 this past season, right? Like, every stat was down. So something about his impact waned, and some of that was this team fit, this past year's Pacers team fit really poorly together. T.J. McConnell was playing in some funky roles. But also, just, you know, even though it didn't never, ever look like his, his presence wasn't being felt, something about the way he was playing and in this new Pacers ecosystem did not make T.J. McConnell as effective as a player as he was in past seasons. And he's not past the aging point yet where you know, he just turned 30 in March. So he was 29 during most of the season. You know, he's not past the age where you think that he's going to drop off. He hasn't even been in the league for more than you know a half decade, barely more than a half decade. He's still got good years left in him. But maybe it's a fit thing. Maybe it was just a weird season. It was obviously the worst Pacer season in forever. But for a team that got you know less than expected from basically every vet role player, McConnell, we talked about Holiday and Craig earlier this week, like you could go on and on. All those guys were sub-expectation, and that was such a big factor in the Pacers being worse than expected. Karis LeVert's in that group. Jeremy Lamb is in that group, right? McConnell is as well, and he really struggled for a lot of the season in so many ways that made it kind of hard to pinpoint, you know, is this on him? Is he aging? Is it a role thing? Is it the players around him thing? And to me, it's a little bit of everything in a way that I think he can bounce back that November stretch when he was in the ideal role is awesome, but it also makes me concerned that maybe he doesn't fit perfectly in the Carlisle system and they're still going to have Halbert next year. And that fit seems like it will be extremely weak at best. One stat that tells it all for me. This was hard. There was a bunch. I've already run through a million stats for TJ McConnell. I went with shooting percentage at the rim. 56.1% from zero to three feet for TJ McConnell this season. Worst of his career by a mile. Only the second time he's ever been under 60%. He was 4% below that 60% number. And look, it, it didn't happen a lot this year, so it's kind of hard to remember. But he had this really money, really, really money turnaround in the lane shot when he would get near the basket that made him a threat to score around the rim and pass. And that dual threat made him really effective as a driver without that shot or with less volume of that shot because he took fewer shots from that distance. It made him a more ineffective player. He became more pass first, which is fine, but it certainly showed – that he had warts in his game finishing around the rim. If he can get that shot back, and maybe some of that is the wrist injury, right? He missed like every shot he took in the last three games of the season. And some of it is, again, playing off ball more, where it's harder for him to get to that spot off of some dribbles. But he didn't get to that spot as often as he has in past seasons, and I think that really hurt him. In an area for growth for TJ McConnell, I'm not telling a, a world trade secret here or a you know, something that you have to to ask for a passcode for. The outside shot's got to be there. He's good enough to be an NBA player and a reserve guard for until his, athlete, or his speed is gone because he's so good at getting into the paint and finding his teammates. But it, with an outside shot, he would level up substantially. And I know that Carlisle's encouraging of the shot itself. He took over one a game. He took the most per game he's ever taken by a mile. He only took 33 in the season because of injury per minute. It was not the highest of his career, but it was close, right? He worked on his form with, his, with some coaches last summer, right? Like, he clearly is working on the three, but if he had it, he would be much more effective as a player. That's not rocket science or anything. So I think it's a big deal for him to get at least – if he could even be 35% on low volume, that would be huge for him because the, the off-ball struggles are a big part of why his season was not as good as you know it kind of expected to be from a lot of people for this Pacers team. So what's his future hold with this franchise? Well, he's got three years left on his deal. 
that deal looking not too good now. Not bad. You know, no one making less than $10 million is in your rotation, and he should be in the rotation next year given who's coming back to the Pacers. It's not a bad contract. Probably a little rich, though, uh, given that the injury happened and that the Pacers completely bombed out this past season and may want to change things up. Um, but not overpaid. Fine contract player. Good backup point guard. And, you know, the, the, the thing that makes his spot interesting is, you know, I talked a lot about how next year is fascinating – because, you know, if you're Kiefer Sexual and Stevenson, it might be hard to come back to the Pacers just because they have already Halliburton and Brogdon and Duarte and Dwayne Washington and Buddy Heald and TJ McConnell all under contract at guard for next season. And that is a lot of guards, and that's a lot of guys who handle it. So if you're McConnell, to me, that does suggest, like, maybe he's a little superfluous. That said, if Brogdon is still playing kind of off-ball next to Halliburton, the only true point guard in that group is Halliburton. So McConnell could still be the backup one. But if Brogdon is back and it makes sense to use him as the backup point guard and run the second units, which was actually the strongest stretch of time of the brogdon Halbert and pairing was when they were both toggling who was running what unit. If that's the case, McConnell might not have a big role next season, and it may make some sense for the Pacers to pursue what they could get in a return for him. I don't think they will actively explore that, but maybe if the right offer comes their way, they can say, hey, this makes sense to kind of bend our team. But you know, Brogdon is going to be the subject of a ton of trade rumors anyway. So if he's out of the picture, uh, then TJ McConnell slides right in as the backup point guard behind Halliburton. And so long as those two don't overlap a ton, because I think they fit pretty poorly together, I think that's a fine, you know, combination of, of point guards to have be your rotation. And when they do share the floor, McConnell needs to be the guy more on the ball next season. You know, he needs the ball like a lot of those other guards, like Buddy Heald and Dwayne Washington, too, to be effective. So it may be a little harder with the new Pacers structure to have McConnell be as good as he was in past seasons, but I still think he can fill in correctly as solely the backup point guard next year in the right structure with the right health and with the right pieces around him. But we'll see. It would make sense to me for the Pacers to explore some options with his future as well. But I think that you know the most likely scenario is that he is the Pacers' backup point guard next year, but I do not put tons of awesome odds on that just given that this team is in so much flux. Like Basically nothing is tied down outside of Tyrese Halbert and Chris Duarte. Let's move on to another one, Ricky Rubio. And all his season with the Pacers, all zero games. But we'll talk a lot about you know his season, his his body of work in general with the Cavs, what it could mean for his future, and of course sign and trade options for him this offseason. Before we do that, though, let's talk about BetOnline.net, our partners who continue to be the number one source for all of your sports betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season NFL futures. Over at BetOnline, your continued source. For all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs to esports and more. Speaking of the playoffs, they've got the NBA lines up on there, as they always do. For tomorrow's games, they've got Heat, Sixers. Sixers favored by two at home in an attempt to send that to a game seven. Suns favored in Dallas by two points in an attempt to close that one out. Looking forward to both of those games. You can get those lines over at betonline.net. Head over to the website today or use your mobile device Sign up and learn more about the trends in the action over at BetOnline.net because BetOnline is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked on Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, go check out Locked on NBA Big Board. Hear more about the latest and greatest prospects around the league from our Locked on NBA Draft hosts. The lottery coming up so Soon, five days. And now we know from Scott Agnes to field those fouls. Kelly Kroskoff, Pacers assistant GM, will be the Pacers representative. Good get by Scott. Very cool rep for the Pacers. Kelly is awesome. Uh, former Fever GM. So, of course, soft spot in my heart. Let's talk about Ricky Rubio. We talked about sign and trade options for him on last Friday's podcast. If you want to understand why he's still under contract with the Pacers and what he could be used for this summer. And we'll talk about that again here in a moment in his season with the Pacers. It's like TJ Warren's. From the last episode when we did the veteran wings, he did not play. What was good about his season with the Pacers? Absolutely nothing. He spent zero seconds with the Pacers. He spent zero seconds in Indiana. He was in Spain rehabbing from the torn ACL he suffered with the Cavs. That reason he was in the carousel vert trade was everything to do with salary and nothing to do with Ricky Rubio helping the Indiana Pacers this season. It's not that he's bad. In fact, I I could make a pretty compelling argument. He's better than TJ McConnell if they do actually sign him to play basketball for the Pacers next year. But the Pacers already have a bunch of guards who fit their system, fit their culture, and can fill those roles just fine. So, yeah, he he was good, but you never know what a guy's going to be like coming off of a torn ACL. So good about a season with the Pacers, not a lot with the Cavs when he was playing. You know, on the very off chance that Rubio does re-sign with the Pacers or is back with the team, 
You know, his defense and passing are what really makes him a standout player, right? His assist rates are always fantastic, 8.4 per 36 minutes in, in small role as a backup for the Cavs this year. That assist percentage is really high. His steal rate's always really good. His defense is always super solid, plus 1.2 defensive box, plus minus. So Ricky Rubio just makes it happen when he's on the floor. Like, if you go to his on-off, he was a plus uh, 8.8 net. This is basketball references net rating, so a little bit of estimation here. Plus 8.8 net rating on the floor for Cleveland, and a plus 9 on-off net rating, meaning the Cavs were 9 points better per 100 possessions when he's out there. Like, he's just kind of a winning player, which makes him fit anywhere and was good about his season, even though he didn't suit up for the Pacers. That value will still exist league-wide, assuming he can get back to being sort of the same player. And all these injuries, the science always gets better about helping guys come back and be just as, or not just as good, but, you know, closer to it as good as they were before. But sometimes the the recovery takes longer as a result of that. It can depend for every player. So we'll see what Ricky Rubio can be. What was poor about his season? Well, he was injured the whole time. Did not suit up for the Pacers for a single moment. Not in the team photo. Doesn't even have a number. A lot of sites that, like, Autobot player numbers say that Ricky Rubio is number 99 for the Pacers this year. Didn't suit up at all. It's impossible to talk about the good and the bad of his season. And, you know, for, for TJ Warren, the bad was that he got kind of re-aggravated and slowed down through the recovery process. That really hurt the Pacers and the projections. Rubio was not ever expected to play, so it's hard to call that a bad thing about his season. He didn't get injured for the Pacers or re-aggravate anything. But not playing, I mean, they're, they were spending, you know, a lot of money on a guy who was not on their team at all. You know, that, that has absolutely no value. That is bad for a team that's building at any stage of a rebuild. And, you know, obviously getting a flat-out zero in impact from any spot is bad. One spot stat that tells it all for Ricky Rubio, look, he might still have value because of that guy who can be a passer and a defender for other teams, but 48% true shooting, oof, oof. I mean, that might scare teams away from thinking he's got enough burst to be a high-level player. And for the Pacers, a really big key in the Ricky Rubio saga as they try to potentially sign and trade him to pick up some assets is that he is good enough to be worth more than the mid-level exception of about $10 million. And I would say if he remains at that efficiency level, maybe for one or two more years, he can be like a $12, $13 million player. But coming off the injury, it might be hard to get that level of value for a guy that's that inefficient, despite him working on his three ball, right, at 33%. If TJ McConnell was at that, that would be excellent for McConnell, for example. But, you know, just not an efficient there. Shot 38% on two-pointers this season. That's what really killed his true shooting is he just couldn't finish inside 48% from zero to three feet. Like he's just got to be a more effective finisher of shots. If he's going to fetch the value the Pacers want. And obviously it doesn't matter. He can't improve those skills and change his stats. Now from this past season, the Pacers are working with the parameters that they have, but for the next team he's on, if he's going to sell and his agent's going to sell that he is worth more than the mid-level exception for the Pacers to get some value here. You know, the, a lot of these stats are going to be mattered and talked about quite a bit. So that's the area for growth for him, just being generally more efficient, whether that's threes, whether that's finishing at the rim, anything like that would be key for Ricky Rubio. This is all grasping at straws, right? Like with most of these players that were traded, I tried to only look at their season with the Pacers, like the time they spent with Indiana. That was zero seconds for Ricky Rubio. He was in Spain the entire time. But if you'll recall, remember, he still might have a future role with the Pacers, not on their team, but in being a key part of their free agency period coming up in July because, look, I, I didn't know what the Pacers thought of Ricky Rubio until three days left in the season. Uh, they made all those moves where Nate Hinton got a two-way, Gabe York got a two-way, Terry Taylor got promoted, Dwayne Washington got promoted, they let Justin Anderson's contract expire, and then they did one more thing. They cut Kiefer Sykes to clear a roster spot to do all those moves, and they could have cut Ricky Rubio to do it. and kept Kiefer Sykes under contract for the rest of the season and had him play in the last couple of games, but they cut Kiefer instead because, and we, you know, we, I kind of had, had theorized this, but you know, you never really know until some, a decision is made because they have Ricky Rubio's full bird rights on his free agency this summer. They can trade him in a sign and trade at any value. They have his full bird rights. They can go up to the max. They shouldn't, but they can, which means they're in theory able to match any salary and any random weird deal they can make or they can make a big trade exception by signing and trading him to another team for nothing. That's what the Pacers did last season, right? Doug McDermott to the Spurs, nothing back to the Pacers in return. Bam, free trade exception for the Pacers, right? Like that is still a possibility for the Pacers this summer is Ricky Rubio to a team with cap space. Here you go. You can have him for nothing in return, right? They can just swap fake second rounders. Bam, Pacers get a trade exception, right? These are things that are really valuable that, that the Pacers could get from Ricky Rubio this summer that Kiefer Sykes would not have provided them. They can't get a big trade exception. They can't really move him. He wasn't in their future plans anyway with how many guards they had. It made more sense to keep Ricky Rubio because of all these sign-in trade options. 
they could sign and trade him for another player with crappy salary. And then you could pick up an asset that way. Maybe a team actually wants him at a high salary number. And the Pacers could pick up, you know, maybe a rotation player in return. I kind of doubt that is what the solution will be. But it seems likely that there's some route, and especially because the Pacers kept him, they have to feel this way too, that they can use his salary in some way that gets them something. Even if it's a trade exception, which is like not considered something useful necessarily. But Pacers having trade exceptions during the season allowed them to create a big trade exception in a trade with the Kings to get a $10 million exception from Jeremy Lamb, which could be helpful in this coming offseason. I'll do a whole podcast on how trade exceptions could help the Pacers this offseason. So I think that, you know, there are ways that Ricky Rubio can, his story with the Pacers could just be that he was a salary ballast and then was immediately flipped for other assets. And that would make the Karis LeVert trade look even better as it ages. But, you know, he didn't play for the team. Reviewing his season with the franchise is sort of a, a waste of time exercise. But thinking about what he could be this offseason is way more valuable in those sign-and-trade situations. I don't think it makes any sense for the Pacers specifically to sign him, although with cap space or his bird rights, they can, in theory, give him the money it would take to keep him in Indiana. And they were linked to him in the summer of 2019. But I think the most likely Ricky Rubio outcome here is that, you know, team some team tries to pursue him and they don't want to use – cap space or their mid-level exception on him. So the Pacers just sign and trade him to another team and the Pacers get something back, even if it's something extremely minimal, like a fringe rotation level guy. But the Pacers don't have a lot of roster spots. I think they would like to send him to a team into space just to get a trade exception back. We'll see what happens, but that is what I think the plan is if you're the Pacers this summer, is to try to use Ricky Rubio's salary in that way. That's the only reason they would have kept him under contract, to me at least, as the season wound down. One more guy to do today. That's Brad Wanamaker. I know a lot of fans just reflex hearing his name. What was his season for the Pacers? Where did it go wrong? What can be learned about the Pacers signing him? Because his future with the team is very low and small and unlikely to ever exist again. But there is things to learn from every signing, even if they don't quite work out. Let's talk about Brad Wanamaker's time with the Pacers really quick, though. I want to talk about the good folks over at Rock Auto who bring you this episode because with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models of vehicles, it is now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need, you got to go in there and you're the pointless questioning from the guy behind the counter about some specs of your car that you never know. You got to go back, look on the little note sticker thing in there or whatever, wait for the guy to order the part you need behind the counter. You got to go back and get it. It's a huge waste of time. You got to compete with access to rockauto.com at home or in your pocket. And that is the way to go. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto instead of spending 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts. In that chain store, Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, and they have prices that are reliably low for every customer. They have everything you could need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, new carpet, you name it. They got it. Go explore their easy news website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on, and they're had you hear about us, Fox. So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. Thank you, as always. For making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen, I highly recommend Locked On NBA here all about the NBA scores as the Bucks survive a crazy, crazy game with the Celtics and the Warriors and Grizzlies currently battling. It's about halftime there, a little after, and the Grizzlies are up by 33. All of our NBA hosts will break down all that action over at Locked On NBA. Let's talk about Brad Wanamaker's season with the Pacers. And look, Brad Wanamaker was signed to be the depth emergency point guard for the Pacers behind TJ McConnell and Malcolm Brogdon. And in theory, they'd rather go to Karis LeVert as their backup point guard before they even turn it over to Brad Wanamaker. Heck, for only about five to ten minutes, but it still happened. The Pacers tried Chris Duarte as their backup point guard instead of Brad Wanamaker. The Pacers did not sign Brad Wanamaker to play, but by God, did that signing turn out to be an absolute disaster. And this is... Look, I'm going to I'm going to vent a little bit about about fan thoughts about basketball before we talk about a season. A lot of times the Pacers will sign or trade for a bit player or a role player and some pushback from fans is who cares? This guy is a small impact, it doesn't matter. They always are just retreading and getting these guys in the door. And like I understand, they're not flashy names or sexy names all the time and maybe they don't move the needle that much. But but even these little signings, your third point guard, your fifth guard, your seventh guard, whatever you want to call Brad Wanamaker at the time he was acquired, they really matter. If Wanamaker was a replacement-level player for the month of December, this Pacers season is completely different. And again, some fans will say, well, hey, they finally did what they should have and tanked, and okay, whatever. But 
They were like two, like I just said it in the McConnell part. They were two games under 500 in November. They had some momentum heading into December. And then it just all fell apart when Wanamaker had to play some serious minutes in that month. And he was just, just terrible that month. I mean, it's really hard to sugarcoat it. I'm usually a guy who tries to cut through and find some positives or some good things to say about what a player did because I sometimes think context is lost. But, you know, the game, the game McConnell got hurt December 1st to the last game Wanamaker played with the Pacers before being waived the day after Christmas, the 26th. He played in 11 games for the Pacers, 3.5 points per game, 2.5 assists, one turnover, shot 43%, missed every three he took in that stretch. Did not make a single one, right? Just a completely underwhelming player who had no, like, force to get into the paint. His defense was okay. That's where his, I think, redeeming qualities were. But Wanamaker just did not give the Pacers what they needed at all. That signing turned out to be a disaster. And I actually thought it was a good idea at the time. After they traded Edmund Summer to save some money, they had a roster spot. They bring in Wanamaker. It's like, great, they need a depth point guard. But that did not, it did not work out at all. That signing was an absolute disaster for the Pacers and really changed the complexion of their season. So what was good about his season? I would say he was an okay defender. You know, I, I mean that sincerely. Like he's stocky for a size 6'3", but still 2'10". So he can get in the face of other point guards and, and be useful on that end of the floor. Or I thought his defensive impact, especially on the ball, was like solid enough. That that, that kept him in the game sometimes. You know, that, that made him playable even when – because there were some times when he was playing alongside Karis LeVert with the second unit, when he was off the ball, that he was okay, right? He kind of made it happen for the Pacers in those moments because when he didn't have the ball as much, he was more effective. But with the ball in his hands, not a good season for Brad Wanamaker. So the defensive side of the ball was certainly where he thrived because when you look at what was bad about his season, so many things. I mean, the turnovers stand out to be the most. Advanced stats, turnover rate. Uh, a, a turnover rate that I would consider kind of high is about 15%, right? That, that is, like, acceptable for a high-usage guy who's making hard passes and throwing guys open, right? A guy with, like, 25 to 30% usage, 15% turnover rate is pretty high. 12% to 10% is pretty fine for role players. And Wanamaker is a role player. And below 10%, I'm like, good, that guy didn't turn it over. Brad Wanamaker's turnover rate was 22%. <laughs> that dude turned it over uh, on 22% of a per 100 possession basis. That is atrocious. Insane per 36 turnover number of 2.8. He His passing was really off the mark. He was coughing it up off his foot. It just wasn't there. And then his three-point percentage, something he was lauded for when he came to the NBA, hit 41% his first year with Boston, 36% his second year, right? His first two seasons in the NBA, he takes 150 basically threes and shoots 38% on him. Great. This is a shooter, right? Nope, that wasn't there either. For the Pacers, he goes four of 17, couldn't impact the game in that way either. So this guy's supposed to be a point guard who can kind of shoot, and he didn't either. He coughed it up all the time and couldn't really penetrate into the paint to set guys up and couldn't knock down the threes. He was just woefully ineffective. And I, I do feel like I'm being overly critical a little bit, but that stretch he had in December, just nothing went right for him for the Pacers. So one stat that tells it all, I'm going to cheat and do two. I wrote down the turnover rate. I already talked about it. 22% turnover rate was just ghastly bad. And that's why Kiefer Sykes, despite being, you know, I would consider Kiefer Sykes a replacement level bench point guard. Replacement level sounds like an insult and it's not. Like you're an NBA player if you're a replacement level. Kiefer Sykes, who has never played in the NBA before, had a 14% turnover rate. That's kind of still high for his usage and 8% lower than Brad Wanamaker's was this season. That's one way that I would describe Brad Wanamaker's season going so poorly. He just coughed it up all the time. Huge negative plays. The on-off numbers sell it perfectly. On the floor, Brad Wanamaker on the floor, Pacers, minus 8.4 net rating. Off the floor, minus 3.3. And that includes the entirety of the season, including the stretch after he was no longer on the team. Just very little impact on winning for a team that needed him to just be fine and he could not even meet that billing necessarily that's you know it just did not work out at all what can he grow in his game I think the shooting has to return right and, and it it's not like atrocious you know the free throw percentage extremely good above 90 percent for his career he led the league in free throw percentage quietly in 2019-20 that's not that long ago right like the the those stats plus his good three-point percentage with Boston to me suggest he still could be a good shooter but it has not been there for the last two seasons right the two seasons since he was not or no longer with the Boston Celtics, he has shot 102 threes and made 19.6% of them, despite still being a good free throw shooter. You know, the jump shot escaping him has been a big part of his decline in that, you know, if he's going to be this guard that isn't really penetrating into the lane at a high level, he's got to knock down threes or be at least a credible off-ball threat on offense. And if the shot's not there, he can't really do that as well. So thankfully, the defense, again, 
was especially on the ball was acceptable for Brad Wanamaker this year, but just so many things went wrong. And some of this, look, let's go back to McConnell. Let's give him a little bit of benefit of the doubt, right? A lot of stuff at the Pacers was clunky and didn't fit this year. And Brad Wanamaker was certainly a victim of that. He came into camp late. He didn't have as much time as everybody else to get up to speed and was playing a lot of different roles next to Karis LeVert, next to other backup guards, and then was you know, pigeonholed into being a creating point guard for them because they needed somebody to do it, and he kind of struggled to do it. And Rick Carlisle loves veteran guards with high IQ. Wanamaker was solid overseas. I get why he had the leash he had. You know, There were a lot of contextual reasons to say, yeah, they should keep trying this, but it it, it did not work. He just did, was not... Not a good signing, didn't work out. Pacers realized it and let go of him early to get Keeper Sykes in the door, which turned out to be a good decision. So he's not going to be with the – he played one game for the Wizards on a hardship deal, got COVID, and that was the end of his season. Brad Wanamaker, technically a free agent. Um, the Pacers will not be signing him. Keeper Sykes is a free agent. Lance Stevens is a free agent. Those are two point guards that make way more sense for the Pacers to bring back than a guy like Brad Wanamaker who struggled mightily for them. That's just two, for example. There's a million other – reserve point guards out there. Gabe York even is an option. Jean Giroux, they on a two-way. These guys are free agents as well. So the, I don't think the Pacers are going to bring back Brad Wanamaker. I don't want to talk about his season from the free agency context, even though he is one. What can they learn from his signing? Well, one thing is, if you listen to Tuesday's show where we review the seasons of veteran wings, every player has an age where they their effectiveness falls off. For Justin Holiday, that appears to be age 32. He hit a big wall this season for both the Pacers and the Kings. For Brad Wanamaker, perhaps he just hit it this past season, right? Perhaps his age 32 season is the one where he can no longer be a, a replacement level or effective NBA player. And he'll be 33 this July. That is perhaps one thing to take away is, you know, you never know with these older role players when they're going to have that wall hit where they cannot be effective anymore and they are just not valuable. That said, Wanamaker was about this good the year before with Golden State and Charlotte, so perhaps not an age thing. I think for me, like, I thought he could be a shooter a little bit. But in general, you know, his past teams, he didn't really have a ton of dribble drive effectiveness, right? So I kind of thought he would kind of just be a shooter and a steady hand who makes, like, the easy passes, like kind of like Darren Collison, basically. But he couldn't even get into the lane as well as Darren Collison. So a guard who can't really, especially a guard, a point guard, who can't really get in the lane and create and also can't shoot, has such little value in the modern NBA, unless they can be the Darren Collison guy who is always like, it's easy to dunk on Darren Collison for making the world's easiest passes on his way to good assist numbers, but he always zipped them right on time on target. He was a really good three point shooter, just a reliable. He never turned it over. Right. Like he was the apex of the, you know, not a good creating point guard and Wanamaker could not do any of that stuff. And the three ball went away. And obviously Darren Collison was an electric three point shooter for the Pacers. So, if you can't get in the lane and create as a point guard and you can't shoot, it's so, 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 so hard to have value in the NBA. And Brad Wanamaker is perhaps the best evidence of that. And I don't think that that's a mistake that will be made very often again by NBA teams because now it's kind of known that perhaps his three-point ball is not a thing anymore after two strong years with Boston. That's it for the reserve guards. we got three more player review groups to do in future weeks. The starting guards of Halliburton, Brogdon, and Levert, the young wings of Duarte, Brissett, and Dwayne Washington, and some reserve wings, Buddy Heald, Keelan Martin, and Justin Anderson. So we'll get to those, but next week's going to be, and tomorrow's show, it's going to be all about the draft, baby. We're in that mode now with the lottery coming up. We'll do a prospect review tomorrow of Dyson Daniels. Next week on Monday, do the big one, Bancaro. Tuesday will be a lottery preview. Wednesday, a lottery fallout. Thursday, we'll get back on the draft. Recaps, we'll talk a little bit about trades next week. With where, knowing where the Pacers will be picking will make those conversations way, way easier, and we'll have it all here on Locked on Pacers. We'll get back to these player season reviews in the final week of May, the week after the draft lottery. So tomorrow, again, Dyson Daniels prospect review, and spoiler alert, I'm very high on G League Ignites Dyson Daniels. Thank you guys a ton for listening. Have a great day, and we will see you then.